Hey everyone, welcome back to the 6.5 Summit. It's day one. We're here in the AI ML data analytics track, but let's call it what it is. It is 2023 and it is the year of AI. And I'm very excited for this next session to get kicked off. It's someone I've had on a number of my shows before. I've got Kavitha Prasad with Intel joining me here. It's a good day to talk about AI. Kavitha, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Dan, and thank you for having me again and look forward to this chat with you. Yeah, it's been fun. I think the last time we did that uh, roundtable together, and that was a big moment. Uh, I think you could agree with me. Uh, we all knew AI had a big future, but I don't know that any of us knew that this exact inflection in 2023 was going to happen when it happened. And my gosh, I can't turn on the TV. I can't really read. I can't read a headline. I can't get on Twitter. I can't, you know, my 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 grandparents, my uncles, my my you know people that are not even in technology, they're like, Dan, what's going on with AI? I mean, are you using this this ChatGPT thing? <laughs> it has. We can very clearly say it's a seminal point in the history, um, Dan. Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's an inflection point where uh, AI has changed the way the world is operating for good or for bad. It is a seminal moment in history. It is. It's really exciting, too. Um, I believe it'll change the world, but I believe it's going to be up to companies. It's whether it's like ours and how we talk about it or like yours and the way you develop and build and democratize it. These are going to be the things that are going to be the catalysts of making AI an additive, a quality of life improvement, whether it's the way we work, the way we communicate, all these different things we do. So you know, one of the things you and I talked about in the past, and I wanted to have a chance to get back on the record and even see how time has shifted this uh, just a few months, because gosh, that's like years in this AI world. But, you know, we talked in the past about like the need to democratize AI. I've said the same thing. I'd love to kind of hear where your head is at on that topic right now. Why do you think it's so important now? And, and kind of when you say democratize, what do you really mean by that? If you really look at the industry reports, Dan, only 11% of the enterprise AI investments have actually uh, resulted in intended ROI for AI, which means there's a lot of focus today on building these exotic models and there's a lot of focus on training, but the real democratization is going to happen only when you're able to deploy these models for business outcomes. And for that to happen, if you think about it, it's not just about uh, deploying it on the cloud or deploying it on the edge. It's across the edge to cloud continuum. You train it once, but you deploy it across, uh, be it on your phones, be it on your client, be it on your um, edge, which could be telco or enterprise, or be it on the cloud. And for that to happen, all these concepts of training, fine tuning, uh, retraining, indexing all that comes into picture for you to actually deploy it meaningfully. And when you actually look at this continuum again, the requirements or the KPIs are so different. Like for example, if you're talking about the edge, the swap requirements become very critical. The size, weight, and power become very critical. Or when you're deploying it on the cloud, the scaling efficiency becomes very critical. So what that does is that redefines what are the compute requirements? What are the software requirements that are needed so that you can scale and deploy your AI meaningfully across this edge to cloud continuum? So 80% or more of the businesses can get the benefits out of uh, their investments. That is when democratization is going to happen. And also for that to happen, if you think about it, it's not just about infrastructure, it's about the talent that is needed to actually go deploy it. And that again needs to combine with security aspects that all needs to come together to deploy these solutions. And along with that, for companies to actually have a meaningful transformation of AI needs to be combined with people, processes, and change management that needs to be happen to be brought together. And when you have deployed it for more than a bespoke use case, but more to actually transform your business is when the democratization of AI is going to happen. Yeah, I think we're starting to see the potential, Kavitha, of the democratization. I think we're starting to see the everybody now is beginning to understand the power. But I think the way that businesses can then start to unlock all of the data and then utilize it to deliver customer experiences, help employees be better at their work, increase 
uh, productivity, lower uh, costs or, you know, and make their businesses run better. I mean, those are all things make businesses run better. Students learn better. You know, all these things are democratization. We're seeing, I think, a window into it right now. But there's so much more that needs to be done. And there's so much challenge there. You know, first of all, you know, we're certainly seeing the spend rise. We're starting to see some of the forecasts and earnings estimates from the, the semiconductor space of how many GPUs they're going to sell. But that it, it's so much more than that. You know, I mean, there's so many different types of workloads. There's so many different types of, of, of chips, whether it's going to be inferencing on a CPU, it's going to be training on a GPU, whether it's going to be an ASIC or an FPGA that might be used, uh, something custom that's going to be designed for one specific type of workload, like we've seen in search or we've seen in recommenders. So there's all that going on. Like, Tell me a little bit in your mind kind of how you're segmenting all these different use cases and all the different infrastructure to really help people understand the whole opportunity of AI. It, it's, it's a very uh, uh, interesting question, Dan, because what sometimes we forget is a models are a means to an end, but not the end in itself. Because for you to develop an application, these models need to be combined with the data layer, with the security, with the privacy needs. They need to be orchestrated meaningfully. There is pre-processing that's involved. There is post-processing that's involved. And eventually you need to deliver it as potentially APIs that can integrate into your existing applications because a lot of these enterprises have their existing applications. They're not gonna undo all their software work either. So how do you integrate it into the existing applications? So it is across this entire layers the software needs to work and your hardware or the compute needs to adjust to the needs of your application that you're developing, right? So like I mentioned earlier, your KPIs vary based on whether you're deploying it on the edge or whether you're deploying it on the cloud. And does your workload require for you to retrain a completely new model or build a new model, retrain it, or do you want to just fine tune it? So your requirements of your compute change based on what you are trying to accomplish. Say, for example, I'm trying to build a brand new model. Yes, you may want to train it based on your accelerators or based on the GPUs that are available. But if now you're trying to deploy it and you just want to fine tune it and deploy it with your pre-processing, post-processing and all of orchestration, everything on an edge, then Xeons or CPUs could be an answer for that. Uh, Xeons in case of Intel, but CPUs could be an answer for that. But if you are trying to do uh, more of specificity and less generality, then accelerators could be the answer for that. And Intel in point in case has Gaudi Habana accelerators to go address it. So it depends on what your key performance indicators are and what you really want to accomplish that your compute requirements are going to change. Say, for example, I'm trying to do, uh, you know, a whole bunch of video processing with, uh, uh, with AI incorporated into it. GPUs are the right answer. So it again, you have to look at your workload. What is it that you are trying to accomplish? What is the business outcome? Where are you deploying it? What is what is it that you want to actually uh, go get out of it is going to define how you deploy it. And in the end, something we all forget is the cost of deployment is going to be very, very critical in figuring out what, where, where and what compute you're going to um, you know target your applications for because sometimes the co cost is not, for economic cost is not going to be sustainable from an economics perspective for you to just go um, say I'm going to deploy it all on these large scale compute. You may not sustain it. So, I mean, even the the biggest software companies and the you know service providers on the planet that are launching these LLMs are looking at this massive cost and going, we better figure out how to monetize this soon. You know, I mean, certainly things like ChatGPT and being with 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 generative is going to change the economics of search for Google. I mean, it just is, you know, for sure. We haven't exactly seen how that plays out, but running these large language models and letting everyone have it for free all day long when you know how much it costs to run it, there has to be a plan. Like at some point we're gonna have to turn we're gonna have to turn the switch on all this stuff and, and start to make it and make it make sense. And then of course you've got the utilization of power in companies like Intel and all these other companies that made big promises to the world to be more uh climate friendly and more sustainable. Well turning up a boatload of GPUs, you're talking clusters, 10,000, 64,000 GPUs to, to run a, 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 a train a model. We're not talking about that. We need to talk about the sustainability thing. And, and the other thing I want to, I want to kind of pivot here, could be then talk to you about though is, is, is software. Because I think a lot of 
why all the hardware has gone in a certain direction is because of software has all kind of come from one place. And I know Intel's working on trying to democratize that. So going back to kind of democratizing, like you can have the democratization of AI to the people, and then you can even democratize hardware and say, well, you can run on all these different types of hardware, but the software to develop it and program it is really, really important. How are you guys thinking about that? Because right now, I think I think most people would argue that a lot of the software and development's happening in one sandbox, and it's not really an open sandbox. That's so true, Dan. Uh, you bring up a very good point because all said and done, AI is a software problem first. Uh, yes, you need the compute to address the needs and the KPIs of all these different workloads, but most of the developer persona, if you really look at it, they are uh, subject matter experts or they're software developers who are coding at a very high level, who want to get the best performance out of the box from the hardware, but want to be as hardware agnostic as possible. And from that perspective, making sure that whatever hardware you're putting out there, the software needs to be available that is easy to use so the development to deployment time is reduced is very, very critical. Otherwise, you can have dime a dozen accelerators, dime a dozen compute architectures. They are not going to fly unless the software is uh, readily available. And the software requirements, again, change based on whether you are a frameworks engineer working at the framework level or are you building an application at a scalable layer where you're putting together large scale compute where you're now talking about deep speed integration, et cetera, where you're talking model parallelization or data, data pipeline parallelization or data parallelization, your software requirements vary. So from that perspective, at least from what we are doing at Intel, I can speak is that whatever optimizations or libraries we develop from a hardware perspective, we upstream it into frameworks. So the customers or the developers or customers who are working out of the, at the frameworks level are able to gain the benefits right out of the box without having to worry about Ninja code to the hardware. And similarly, when you go up, the stack and you're trying to make sure that you are getting a meaningful scaling efficiency. In fact, we recently had a run where we were able to put together, I think around 256 Zeons and 512 our accelerator Gaudis where for one of the largest 175 billion parameter model, our scaling efficiency was 97%. If you think about it, 97% of your compute is getting utilized effectively. That imagine the price performance advantage a customer is gonna get out of it. But all these, software enhancements, library enhancements that we do, we open source it and we up level it into the uh, you know, open source community so the customers can benefit right out of the box while uh, getting the you know, hardware benefits agnostically to their workload needs. Yeah, I, th I, th I think what's ended up making hybrid and multi-cloud a reality is gonna also be what helps make AI a reality. I think Correct. there's always an opportunity in the early days for sort of a more closed architecture to be a pathway to the early adopters. And, you know, it's often somewhat uh, limiting though, when you want to get things to scale. And, and I guess what I'm saying here is that open, open sourcing the cloud was what actually made it become a uh, multi-cloud become a reality. Open sourcing AI is what's going to democratize and make AI something that can be deployed and scaled up. And, you know, a future there's going to be the, the GitHub of, of, of AI. It's going to be, you know, snippets of code and things that people have done to accelerate and they're going to be sharing and growing and knowledge is going to be democratized. And then you're going to see the most value on every processor. And that's also how you get more efficiency because, you know, why, why reinvent the wheel? That's so true. Open sourcing while making sure you are keeping the while the customers are able to operate within their security perimeter so that their data is safe is going to be very critical, Dan, because it's important to have the open ecosystem, but at the same time, you want to make sure that the companies are able to keep their data private, secure, and operate within their security perimeter. So both of them need to work hand in hand for the meaningful deployment to happen. Absolutely. So one of the things that I always think is important for people to be able to digest a session like this is going from sort of philosophical, which we've done, a, I think, a pretty nice job of, Kavitha. We've been, we, we've been up there, but is, is now going to the more practical and, and really talking about what you're seeing from customers. You know, Intel works with thousands and thousands of, of companies. And right now you're working side by side to help companies get benefits um, in, and apply enterprise AI to solve business problems. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the specific examples um, of how your customers are, are 
putting enterprise AI to use? And what are some of the ones that you think are really valuable that many co more companies could benefit from? Definitely, Dan, that's a very good question. And now in the uh, in the era of generative AI, where it has just caught the world by fire, I'll give you an example of the generative AI platform that we uh, partnered with BCG to actually bring it meaningfully to the enterprise uh, is a very good example that will uh, walk you through what we did, right? So in this particular context, BCG, the Boston Consulting Group is, has, you know, it, the data is the company, if you think about it, and it's 50 years worth of data that they were working on and they wanted to enable semantic search or semantic knowledge discovery on top of it. So we partnered with them to make sure that we were able to take their 50 years worth of data in a very secure way where we are with, uh, with double blind privacy, where not looking at their data, not looking at their results. So their data chain is completely protected, develop the generative AI models, uh, and then actually orchestrate it around their 50 years worth of data in a secure way and deploy it in their security perimeter so that they get the results right out of the box. And that is something that, uh, is very, very uh, interesting because two, one, it met the security criteria of a company, of an enterprise where they didn't have to worry about their data being publicly viewable or even Intel did not look at their data. And second thing, it was deployed within their security perimeter, which is very important. Again, it could be hybrid, cloud, or it could be on-prem. It, it, it did not matter to us. So working with Intel, where we were able to develop their models with their data in a, uh, uh, in a private way or double, uh, the double blind privacy is what we call about it and develop it on the Intel AI supercomputer, which was a mix of Gaudi's and uh, Xeon uh, uh, scalable processors to create those ensemble of models, orchestrate around it and deploy it within their security perimeter all within a matter of 12 weeks was something that we did. And we are really proud of this collaboration because people talk about deploying it for enterprises. We did it. Yeah, that's a great example and, and and congratulations on the timeline. What I would say is speed to value is probably one of the most important uh, determinants right now in terms of AI investments, meaning can we automate, optimize, can we become more productive, gain more efficiency, and can we measure it? And then once you can start to do that, then a lot of the costs, whether it's software development, whether it's hardware implementation, becomes really easy to justify. And so this movement, while it feels like a bit of an arms race, it feels like it's a bit of a, of a gold rush, whatever you want to call it, it should be a gold rush rooted in really performance metrics inside of your enterprise, that this is supposed to help your business perform better. So that, Kavitha, is a great example. Yeah, it was a fantastic example because BCG was an equal partner in this where yep. they were able to deploy it into their UIs, where they developed, built the UIs, they took the APIs, they deployed it into their UIs, and they managed, the, they enabled the change management, people processes took us through it. So it was a fantastic collaboration. And this is what more of this is needed for us to actually deploy AI meaningfully in the enterprises, Dan. Well, Kavita, I look forward to hearing more, learning more, and seeing more from Intel, how the company continues to meaningfully deliver value in the enterprise and across all the different businesses, markets you serve and developing, you know, various processes. And of course, in the future foundry, of course, as well for AI chips. Um, however, for this conversation interview, I got to say goodbye for now, but I really appreciate you taking the time to join us here at this year's six, five summit. It's always great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Dan. It was a pleasure. All right, everyone. This is the AI track and as you can see, it's action packed. That was a fast paced conversation. And it is one that I have a feeling we're going to be continuing to have, not just here at the 6.5 Summit, but on the 6.5 and basically across every channel that you're going to be paying attention to every single day. But for the show, I want you to watch all of our other sessions. They're all available on demand. So if you can't catch them live, just hit subscribe. We appreciate you being part of the 6.5 community. Bye for this segment, but we'll see you soon on another one. Mm -hmm.